Hey guys, Matt here. Good to see you. Um, we actually at Youth have been doing a series in Ephesians, and believe it or not, I had actually prepared a sermon in advance to close off that series, and so I thought, why not video the sermon I prepared and share it with you guys? Now, I've taken this and I've edited it a little bit to make it a bit more relevant to our time and what's been going on in the world, but still, I wanted to share this with you. So why don't you guys grab your Bibles, grab some pens, grab a notebook or a note sheet or just a blank piece of paper, or whatever, to take notes on, and we can finish off our, our Ephesians series well. So let's do that together. Grab your Bible, pen, note sheet, whatever it is you need, and let's read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 together. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this text in Ephesians. Thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us your armor. Thank you, Lord, that you have sent your son Jesus to die for our sins so that we might have this armor. And I just pray, Lord, that you would work in our, our, our hearts by your Holy Spirit in this time together. I pray all of this by your holy name, amen. So in the 1800s, a disease known as cholera made a massive outbreak in London and people became really, really, really afraid of this disease. You know, oftentimes people who had caught cholera had sudden symptoms that just appeared out of nowhere and within hours they would die. And there was a problem with all of this that was unbelievable. No one had any idea where it came from. So a young man, you know, by the name of John, of John Snow began to investigate all this. Now remember, this is a time before people knew about germs and all that other stuff. So the only way that he could figure out how this was happening was by going around to the people who had already been sick and asking them questions. And he'd ask them questions about what they ate, what they do in their days, where they went, that kind of thing, to figure out what was causing this outbreak. And after working tirelessly to figure out what's, uh, what this was, he suspected that it was something in the water. And this seems weird because we, you know, we just take safe and clean drinking water for granted. But back then, they couldn't do this. You know, this is before sewers and, and water treatment plants, and when people needed to get rid of waste, they would literally just take it and throw it into the streets, and it would go down into these storm drains that would then uh, release all of it into the River Thames. And guess where people were getting their water from? That's right, they were getting it from the river. 
So as Jon Snow worked, he found that people who lived downstream from the places where all this rubbish and all this filth would wash out were getting sick faster and much, much worse. But no one believed him. That is until a massive outbreak of cholera began killing people near Broad Street. So Jon Snow, you know, he headed over there to investigate what was going on. And what he found was that everyone who got sick and died had gotten their water from what's known as the Broad Street Pump. And it was this place where you'd pump your water out from the ground. And he took all his evidence to the local board and presented his case. And they finally believed him. And they removed the pump handle from the pump so no one could get their water from there anymore. And the cholera outbreak stopped. Now this was huge. This was massive. He had proven that hygiene and sanitation prevented deaths and saved lives. It was the first step in the modern world uh, to, towards a real medical movement that sought to eradicate diseases through things like vaccines and sanitation and so on. You know, the work he did put an end, an end to cholera in the developed world. But did you know that 120,000 people every single year still die from cholera. Even though we know what causes it, and even though we know it is preventable, it still pops up. And this is the reality of Jon Snow's work. You know, his work ultimately set in stone the eventual defeat of this particular disease. Good sanitation standards meant this disease will die out. But it still hasn't been completely defeated yet. There is still more work to do. There's still more sanitation to be done before it's completely gone. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is because when we come to our passage today, we're dealing with a text that has been shaped by a similar reality to this. You see, Jesus, when he went to the cross, he won the decisive victory over the ultimate disease, sin and death. But we still live in a world where sin and death exist. You see, Jesus has won the decisive victory over these things. But the war is not over yet. It's not over yet. We still wait for the final return of Jesus Christ and the day when he will make all things right. And we live in a world full, full of sin and death and all sorts of evil. So how are we supposed to live in this reality that the decisive victory has been won for us, but that we live in a world where the final victory has not yet come? Well, today, that's exactly what our passage deals with. And when we turn to Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, we get Paul's answer. You see, Paul is telling the Ephesian Christians how to continue in a present world of sin and death. And what he tells them to do is to stand firm, to persevere in their faith. So our big point today is this. The victory has been won, but stand. And we're going to look at three things. Why we stand what we stand in, and how we stand. So flip in your Bibles with me to Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, and let's look at our first point together, why we stand. Let's read this together. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We stand because we have an enemy. And we see this enemy all over this text. You know, verse 11 says we stand against the schemes of the devil. And in verse 12, it says that we wrestle against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil. So it's clear that Paul has an enemy in mind here. Paul is trying to show the Ephesian Christians that there are evil spiritual powers which they're actually fighting against. And this is shown even more when Paul says that we wrestle against them. Now that that verb conveys a sense of hand-to-hand combat. It's this intimate battling that Paul has in mind here. And he makes it very clear that it's not physical beings that we're wrestling with. It's not against flesh and blood, he says, but against the evil powers in the spiritual realm. See, we have an enemy. We have a spiritual enemy that seeks to enslave us, to accuse us, to tear down every single good thing that God is doing in Jesus Christ. You know, I love this John Stott quote, where he takes all the themes of Ephesians and shows how the enemy attempts to ruin them. Look, at, Listen to this, you know, it says... It is God's plan to create a new society, then they will do their utmost to destroy it. Has God, through Jesus Christ, broken down the walls, dividing human beings of different races and cultures from each other? Then the devil, through his enemy emissaries, will strive to rebuild them. Does God intend his reconciled and redeemed people to live together in harmony and purity? then the powers of hell will scatter among them the seeds of discord and sin. We have an enemy that we stand against, and he doesn't play fair. He's going to do whatever it takes to tear down God's kingdom. He's going to attack you personally so that you won't stand firm in your faith. But he's also going to make attacks on a grander scale. He'll attack the whole world and do things in the whole world that we think are weird. And isn't this exactly what he's doing right now in our midst? I mean, think about how chaotic our world has gotten in just the last week alone. You know, every time I look at the news or look at my social media feed or whatever, there's more arguments, there's more anger, and all uh, at the way things are going, and everything is getting worse and worse. You see, the enemy is tearing down the work of Christ. Or think about how the enemy divides us racially, even. Even in our own churches, We're divided over race. Maybe not intentionally. Maybe it's not something we do on purpose. But the way we act towards others and talk about others shows that our hearts can be set against them. See, the enemy is trying to divide the church. Even lately, you know, I've been hearing about all this racism bubbling up to the surface in some new people's lives because they're fearful of coronavirus. People are worried that they'll catch it from those people or from these people. You see, this is the work of the evil one. And we're called in the midst of it to stand firm, to stand against his schemes and what he's doing. But God doesn't leave us unprepared. He equips us. And that's our second point today, which is what we stand in, what we stand in. Look at verse 13 through 16 in our passage. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. You see, we stand in the armor of God. We're actually equipped to withstand the forces of the evil one because we have been given God's armor. So we're told to take up the belt of truth, which means putting away our tendency to lie and be deceitful. We're told to put on the breastplate of righteousness and to actually do good works in this world and to act justly and fairly with other people. We're told to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Now, a Roman soldier's shoes had studs on them to keep them firmly grounded. And that's the kind of shoe Paul is referring to here. And we are meant to be firmly grounded in the gospel of peace. Planted with our feet firmly on the ground and the studs of our cleats dug into the reality that the gospel has brought us peace with God. We're told to take up the shield of faith, for example, and to trust in God that he has saved us so that when the enemy hurls his accusations at us and shoots his flaming darts of accusations our way, we can rest in our faith, knowing of the saving work that Jesus has accomplished for us. So here's my question for us today. You know, which piece of armor are you missing? Look back at verse 13 with me. Paul says that we should take up the whole armor of God. And if we're missing a piece, well then we're vulnerable to attack, aren't we? We're vulnerable to falling and to not standing firm in the gospel. If we don't believe that truth is from God, and that all lies, all lies are a result of the evil one, then we're going to be left without a belt. And we're going to be caught with our pants down, unable to stand firm in the day when we have to face the enemy's attacks. If we don't act righteously and according to God's word, then we are without a breastplate. And all of our vital organs are vulnerable to attack. If we don't rest in the reality that we have peace with God, then we are left without shoes and we'll have no grip to stand firm. If we don't have faith that Jesus has proclaimed us forgiven and righteous in God's sight, then we will be without the protection that comes from our shield. And whenever the devil accuses us, whenever he he pokes at our sore spots in our heart, we are going to be so cut down in our that our trust in Jesus is going to be completely destroyed. You know, when I was a kid, I, I used to play a lot of hockey and there was this one kid on my team and he would always forget a piece of his gear you know one week he would forget his elbow pads another week he'd forget his skates another week he'd forget his helmet and he'd have to get his parents to drive all the way back to his house pick up the piece of gear that he had forgotten bring it back he'd put it on and then he could play the game You see, he couldn't play the game unless he had all the gear to play the game. He couldn't succeed at the task that was before him until he was adequately prepared for it. And that's what it's like when we go out without the whole armor of God. You're ill-prepared. You're vulnerable to attack. So which piece of armor... Are you missing in your life? 
It says, take up the whole armor of God. Now, this is all well and good. You know, we can know who the enemy is and we can take up the whole armor. But unless you know how to stand, then you're still going to be vulnerable to the work of the enemy. And this brings us to our third point, which is how we stand. Look in your Bibles with me at Ephesians 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We stand in what we have received. Now, verse uh, 17 makes a really important shift in our passage, and I don't want you guys to miss this. Paul shifts his verbs from things we do to things that are done for us. If you look back in our passage, you can see that Paul tells us to fasten the belt on, to put on the breastplate and the shoes, to take up the shield. And all of these things are things that we do. But in verse 17, Paul shifts and says, receive the helmet of salvation. Now, if you're looking at your Bibles, you're probably going, no, it doesn't say receive. It says take. And you're right. It does say take. But the Greek word for take can also mean receive. And in this context, to receive seems to be the sense that Paul wants to convey to us. And I think what Paul is trying to show us by using this verb is that we are both active in putting on the armor, but we're also passive in receiving parts of the armor directly from God. You know, Paul's language here suggests that we as Christians are participative in what God is doing, not passive. And this is something that Paul actually deals with a lot in his other epistles. You know, look at what he says. For example, in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, he writes, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We are to work out our own salvation but at the same time, it is God who works in us. We participate in putting on the armor of God, but we receive from God. And we receive two things. First, it says we receive the helmet of salvation. And this makes sense. You know, our salvation was something that was declared over us. It's God's work to save us, not our work. And he's done it through Jesus on the cross. And when we put on the helmet of salvation, when we receive the helmet, it's referring to the assurance we have that Christ's death and resurrection has won the ultimate victory against sin and against death. See, we know in our minds that Christ's death has defeated the enemy. And knowing this protects our heads from the lies of the evil one. Secondly, we receive the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. Now, this is interesting because this is the only weapon that's mentioned in this passage. Why? Well, I think it's, it helps us to look at a story to see why this is. And we find this story in the Gospel of Matthew. See, Jesus, he's been wandering the desert for 40 days. He's tired, he's hungry, it's hot, and it's just horrible out there. And we're told that in the moment of weakness that he's experiencing, the devil comes to him and tempts him and tries to bait him into creating bread for himself. And this is what Jesus answers the devil. It is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 against the devil. Jesus uses scripture as a weapon against the evil one. See, scripture has been given to us to defeat the lies of the evil one. And all of this means that we can stand firm because we have received the assurance of our salvation and we have received the word of God to combat the evil one. So this is what Paul wants us to do, to stand firm. But you know, we don't go out and do these things unsure of what the outcome is going to be. See, we know the outcome. We know, we know that Christ has won the ultimate victory on the cross. And that the powers of the devil have been defeated by Jesus. You see, our ultimate disease has been done away with, and our enemy is weak. We are fighting against a losing enemy. And while there's still battles to be fought, we can now stand firm in our love for Jesus and in his love for us because we stand in the knowledge of Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. God is going to crush Satan under our feet. So stand, because the victory has been won. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would work through it. Father, transform hearts and minds to see the love of your son Jesus in this text. Lord, he has given us our salvation and we can have assurance that we have been saved and we can know that he loves us and that you love us and have adopted us into sonship. Lord, thank you for the time we had in Ephesians over this last year. And I just pray, Lord, that we would continue to seek to understand your word in a deeper way in this season. Lord, you are a good God and we love you. And I pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.